Thank you and welcome everyone. We're glad that you're all here to join us for today's webinar on Educator Effectiveness and Assessment Literacy for Educators. As Amala mentioned, my name is Elizabeth Greninger. I'm today's webinar facilitator. And joining me is Dr. Edward Raber, the Assessment Director for the Michigan Assessment Consortium. In just a moment, I'll tell you a little bit more about Dr. Raber, but first I want to find out who's joining us today in the audience. Just a moment, you should see a poll come up on your screen, and we'd like you to click the response that best fits the role in which you serve. It's nice to see a wide range of folks joining us today from the classroom level all the way up to the state level and lots of researchers, higher ed folks with us. We do hope that the content of today's webinar will meet the needs of all the different roles you serve. And we encourage you to ask questions and to ensure that we're touching on the topics that are important to you with regard to assessment literacy. Okay, we're going to move right along so we can get into today's presentation. Before I turn it over to Dr. Raber, I'd like to give you a description of the work that he's done. Dr. Raber is a consultant in educational assessment. Currently, he serves as the assessment director of the Michigan Assessment Consortium, otherwise known as MAC. There, he provides direction to the assessment component of the Michigan Arts Education Instruction and Assessment Program, and he directs a research component for the state's formative assessment for Michigan Educators Project. He co-directs the MAC board committee that has defined assessment literacy standards for students, teachers, administrators, and policymakers, as well as developing assessment literacy self-assessments for teachers, administrators, and policymakers. Ed has served as an assessment advisor on student assessment to the WIDA Consortium at the University of Wisconsin. He has served as an adjunct professor in the MSU College of Education from 2007 to the present. And he's directed the Student Assessment Program and then Assessment and Accountability Unit in the Michigan Department of Education. Ed has worked at Measured Progress and the Council of Chief State School Officers. He received his PhD in Measurement and Evaluation from the University of Michigan in 1970. Coming to us with a wealth of experience and background in this area, I'm pleased to introduce to you Dr. Ed Raber. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, oops. Sure can. Okay. Hmm. I'm going to get in. Okay. Good. Sorry about that. Um, it's it's a pleasure to be with you, and particularly uh, a pleasure to uh, be here. Um, will um, um, without having to travel to all of the places that are represented uh, among the list of attendees. I, I hope that uh, uh, what I present will be of use to you. Uh, I know that assessment literacy is becoming an increasingly important part of, uh, of our concerns about education and uh, not necessarily so a few years ago when we began our work in the Michigan Assessment Consortium, but I'm pleased to see that, that there is so much going on. And, I'll try and touch on as much as I can during this webinar, but there's a lot more that, that those of you that are interested can find. And I'll try and give you some hints about where you can go to get more information as well. But I, I want to touch on these questions of focus. You know, why is an assessment literacy an important area of understanding for educators? 
why is a coherent balanced assessment program critical to improving student achievement? And uh, one of the questions that came is, is, what the heck is a balanced assessment program? Does that mean an equal number of each type of assessment? And no, the answer is it doesn't. Um, it means that, that we try to uh, balance the uh, mandated uh, summative assessments, assessments of student learning, with a much larger array of assessments for learning uh, that, are, that are used, assessment processes and procedures that are used during instruction uh, so that we balance the, 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 the summit of assessments. And then what are some of the key points about assessment that educators should know and apply to their practice? Uh, there are two resources uh, available for download, actually a third one, this PowerPoint, but, but also the assessment literacy standards uh, that were created by the Michigan Assessment Consortium from a number of really good resources. And then uh, a, an assessment literacy self-assessment kind of uh, uh, short form um, that, that you can, uh, 20 questions that, that you could use in workshops or you could take yourself. Um, it'll help you understand more about uh, uh, assessment and where your assessment literacy is. Uh, during this webinar, we're going to do several things. Uh, we're going to describe what assessment literacy is. Um, and I, I might note that uh, several of the questions that came in prior to the webinar talked about what is the difference between assessment literacy and data literacy. Are they related? Are they the same? Um, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try and touch on that in, a little bit later. Uh, who needs to be assessment literate and why is assessment literacy essential? Um, what, what are some other definitions of assessment literacy? Um, this is, not, you know, the work that the, the MAC produced was really drawn from a, a number of sources. And what we did is try and synthesize those and present those in an attractive manner. But I'll, I'll share with you some of the, the, the prior work that, that we drew from. Um, describe the kinds of knowledge, actions, and beliefs that educators and others should have because we believe that these comprise assessment literacy. It's, knowing about assessment, being able to carry out assessment activities in a sound fashion, and, and, and do so because of beliefs about the value uh, of, of, of assessment uh, in, in instruction and student learning. Um, and, then, and then talk a little bit about how educators, both in-service and pre-service, uh, can become more assessment literate. Uh, uh, and then uh, resources that, that we have uh, the MAC is created to help you determine your current levels of assessment literacy. So let's set the stage. Um, this is the definition of assessment literacy that the Michigan Assessment Consortium created and is included in the literacy standards available for download. Um, that an assessment literate individual is one that understands how student assessment, focused on that, can enable them the assessment in literate individual to better carry out their role in education, uh, believe that assessment can improve teaching and learning, and put into place activities and behaviors that reflect those beliefs. So again, it's a combination of knowledge and practice with, with dispositions or, or attitudes that, that talk about that. So how is that different than, than data literacy? Well, to me, uh, data literacy is is an understanding of how how to uh, obtain be, uh, meaningful information from data. Uh, it, it includes reading data reports, creating data uh, summaries and data tables, and communicating with data. Um, to me, data data literacy is far broader than assessment literacy. Assessment literacy deals with an understanding of the instruments that are used um, and the processes that are used to uh, collect achievement information. But of course, there are many other types of data that, that educators, citizens, parents, students uh, might, might need to interpret. Uh, other types of outcomes, uh, indicators such as the, the inputs to education, the processes used, etc. So that, that data literacy and assessment literacy I view as, as very much o overlapping. In a Venn diagram, there would be quite a commonality, but there'd be some unique things as well. Uh, data, data literacy tends to focus on, 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 I have this information, now how do I derive, or data, how do I derive information from it that's useful? 
whereas assessment literacy focuses on uh, the the manner in which that 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 uh, assessment data that sub part of all of the data that's collected uh, can be can be collected and used. Uh, so very much very much related. Uh, I, I think that, that when we think about a coherent uh, set of measures, uh, this graphic that Joan Herman uh, and Margaret Heritage uh, produced, I think is a, uh, a useful one. Um, uh, frankly, if I, if I had drawn it, I would reverse the size of those columns. Um, the minute by minute would be the largest, daily would be the next uh, a little bit smaller, weekly a little bit smaller, and the annual would be quite small, the equivalent of the minute by minute in terms of the importance for the student and for the teacher. Um, but uh, our annual assessments are what gets all the publicity, gets published in the newspapers, and, and takes on a, a life of its own. And uh, while the uh, Every Student Succeeds Act may change some of that, or at least offer the opportunity for that, such changes won't be occurring for at least a year or two, if they occur at all. Uh, but I think that, that this, this shows that a, 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 the coherency in, in, in assessment uh, can, can occur, or it may not. Uh, but if it does, then it really helps students uh, achieve the, the standards uh, that, are, that are being taught. So who needs to be assessment literate? Well, um, the simple answer to that is everyone. Um, everyone with a stake in education. And who pretty much doesn't have a stake in education? needs to be assessment literate. Certainly the students and their parents and guardians, uh, the teachers, uh, specialists at the district and school levels, building administrators, central office administrators, policy makers at the local level, the local superintendent and school board, at the state level, uh, the state board of education, state superintendent, legislature, governor, uh, and at the national levels, Congress, uh, the US Department of Education, and uh, and, and the president, and of course, general public, and you could add business leaders to this as well. A lot of people are concerned about education and whether we're producing students that our country needs to be an economically viable uh, power in the, in the world, and, and so uh, the, the, everyone has a, has a stake in, in, in this. Um, but but I, I, I indicate in, in my presentation and, and in the assessment literacy standards, the motivation for those standards was a belief that relatively few educators, relatively few students uh, and parents, uh, relatively few policymakers or administrators are assessment literate. And the result is that uh, this rampant assessment illiteracy has several impacts on education. Um, and we've seen this at the state level in states like Michigan, where um, legislators get involved in debating different types of assessment for different purposes without a deep understanding of, of the different programs. And that, in, that increases the likelihood that inappropriate policies and regulations are adopted, um, unrealistic timelines, uh, uh, inadequate resources are allocated, uh, etc. It may result in lower student achievement because the full potential of a variety of assessment strategies, that is both the, the formative and summative strategies, are not being used by educators. Then that results in missed opportunities to improve student achievement. Uh, it can increase the volume and change the types of assessment used because after all, if we have a problem, let's, let's buy another test. Uh, that'll take care of it. Uh, certainly, the test salespeople will tell us that. Um, and to me that it, it increases the stakes for students, educators, and schools. More time is spent on, on testing. Um, parents may, may not understand the purposes and keep their kids home from school on test day. The, um, the uh, uh, so-called opt-out movement, um, although there's not data at this point that indicates that assessment illiterate parents are the ones keeping their kids out. There may be some uh, uh, data to the con contrary, that, that uh, more assessment literate parents are the ones more, more likely to opt their kids out because they see that the, the, the variety of tests are used, the, the amount of testing time that they take, uh, and that the, the, they don't necessarily feel that they result in, in constructive uh, uh, instructional action on the part of teachers or students. Well, 
Why is assessment literacy needed? And I, th I think there, these are just a, a few of the points, um, others that could be made uh, as well. But, you know, research has shown that students are more involved in their own learning and are, and are competent self-assessors. That, that is able to adequately and, and accurately self-assess are more confident learners who achieve more. Black and William have, have documented that. The use of formative assessment practices literally during instruction has been shown to be most effective in helping all students learn. And I want to pause here for a second and, and indicate that, that formative assessment practice, as I'm using it, is not a test. It's not a thing. If, it has a, if, if, if formative assessment has an S on the end of assessment, formative assessments, then, then it's probably an interim uh, or benchmark assessment, uh, which is different than formative assessment practices literally used during instruction which is a teacher who has thought about, when I teach today's lesson, I'm going to stop at this point, see if kids got it. I know what I'm going to do if they did. I'm, I know what I'm going to do if they didn't. I'm going to move on. Or I'm going to go back over material. That's what I mean by formative assessment practice. And that has been shown as one of the most in effective interventions in helping students learn. But that, that effective use of formative assessment practice requires teachers to understand how ongoing and structurally embedded assessment strategies can help all students achieve at higher levels. That is that, and we're not talking about tests here, we're talking about things like uh, an oral uh, interview with a student, maybe observation of students, uh, and, and uh, questioning done um, of, of random students at, at integral parts of, in a lesson. More balanced approaches to assessment require an understanding of how the formative and summative assessment can work together. Assessments for learning, assessments of learning. And then, then you know, to me, the improved student achievement comes from knowing how to use each type of assessment and the results of those effectively. And there might be a, a, a place where assessment literacy, data literacy uh, uh, touch one another. And, and we also know that administrator involvement in school improvement activity is, is related to uh, higher student achievement. And so that the more that the administrator is an active participant helping to lead a, a, and, and work um, strategically with a, with a school improvement team in a school or a district, the better uh, student achievement because the, the school administrator can better sense what, what the educators and students need and, and can help to provide the resources that they need. But the problem is, and this is the, 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 the real issue, relatively few classroom teachers and even fewer school administrators are assessment literate when they've completed their pre-service programs or become so when they're employed. And in fact, most assessment literacy activity takes place after teachers have finished their pre-service programs or when administrators uh, were on the job as teachers because they, they don't often get that in their administrator pre-service pre program. And the result is that many miss opportunities, which I think leads to too much testing, uh, too much testing of the wrong kinds, too little use of assessment results, and a whole lot less of, of improvement in achievement than um, we, we might want. So that, that assessment literacy is, is a serious issue and one that I think has to be addressed both in the in-service arena as well as the pre-service one. Elizabeth? Wonderful. Thanks, Ed, for taking us through that important discussion about what we're characterizing as the definition of assessment literacy for today's purposes and for Mac's work over the years. And so at this point, we want to understand from our participants, what is your experience with assessment literacy? So you'll see a box come up on your screen, and you'll have the opportunity to type in an open-ended response. Just a brief uh, description of your experience in this topic. While we give folks some time with that, I'll just mention a few things, housekeeping items. If you have technical issues, I know a few folks were having some problems hearing, and hopefully that's all been corrected. But if you do have continued technical issues, you see the box at the bottom. And one of our staff members will help you with that problem. 
Uh, as we mentioned, there are some resources down below as well. You can click on each of those and download today's PowerPoint, as well as the Literacy Self-Assessment and the MAC Assessment Literacy Standards. Um, we hope you'll find those materials very useful. Uh, there's also some links there. We'll get to those later. But um, folks are having some comments in the parking lot. Ed, hopefully you've gotten a chance to kind of glance through those and yeah. see um, the feedback we're getting on your discussion of formative assessment practice. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe I could uh, say a, uh, answer a couple of them. Or um, There are a, a couple yeah. of people that uh, I think would be very helpful for those of you who want to find out more about formative assessment practice. Um, the two two individuals who I cite uh, in here, uh, but uh, are Margaret Heritage uh, and Susan uh, Brookhart. And if you were to Google either one of those, Susan has written extensively on the topic. Margaret has is has also written uh, on this, uh, as has Jim Popham. Uh, they will they will provide you um, uh, information uh, about what what I mean by formative assessment practice, uh, that the on spot, if you will. Um, Question about, uh, yeah, it, formative assessment practice does take time. In Michigan, we have the formative assessment for Michigan education uh, project, and, and uh, uh, the, the teachers who volunteer to participate in that are, are volunteering to participate in a three-year effort. Uh, they meet monthly, usually for a couple of hours. Uh, the teacher's response to that, though, is the, it's the best professional learning activity they have engaged in in their career. Uh, they uh, are... Uh, oftentimes say that they're re-energized about teaching again because they're so focused on helping kids learn and they see it uh, in, in their students learning and, and that's very energizing, you know, as when you're a teacher and you see students learn from you. Um, do I have data about teachers and pre-service teacher level of assessment literacy competent? No, unfortunately there's not a lot of information about that and uh, what what's really needed, I, I've seen individual studies, just looked at one this today, but they're, they're usually from a district or that uh, they're not uh, one of the reasons why the MAC has created our self-assessments, literacy, assessment literacy self-assessments, is we want to collect data. Uh, not not just, you know, how did you have a course on classroom assessment in your pre-service program, but uh, uh, to get to the actual knowledge and, and skills and, and dispositions of, of individuals such as teachers. Um, I, th I think it's an area that's that that is uh, uh, really missing. Um, Rick Stiggins a few years ago had done a, a survey of of, of uh, higher ed and institutions. His estimate was that about 20% of pre-service teachers uh, were received some type of instruction uh, on assessment. Um, and I know that that part of the issue in in carrying out such research is defining what. What is what is teaching and learning at the at, in a college program? Um, but uh, it looked like quite a quite that's helpful. Ed. Thanks for thanks for answering those questions. And I will also add for our participants two of the folks you mentioned, Jim Popham and Margaret Heritage. We've done a webinar with each of those individuals and folks can find those archives of the events that we ran. I think, gosh, my memory is failing me because we've, we're in our fourth year now, but I think in year two, so two years ago, we hosted events with each of them. Um, and I think maybe someone from our team can post up the link for that. Um, folks might want to take a look and gain some more information on the work each of those researchers has done. Right. Um, let's move over here to looking at our responses um, to folks' experience with assessment literacy. What I'm seeing as I, I glance through is a range of experience. So some people have very extensive experience and some have very little. And we hope that whatever level of experience you have, you're going to learn something new today. And our ultimate goal is that folks walk away with a plan for using some new information and thinking about how that applies to the roles you serve in. Mm -hmm. uh, I do see there's quite a few folks who work with educators in some capacity in teaching about assessment literacy. So this is a great webinar for, for those of you who serve in that role. Um, Ed, do you see anything 
here from participants that particularly jumps out at you? Well, I, 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 what I see is that uh, people that have extensive experience and some not, <laughs> which is usually the case of a webinar like this, that uh, some have more experience than others. Um, and I think that, that uh, what I see for some of those that, that with experience is that a lot of it focuses on summative assessment, which of course is not surprising given the prevalence in American education. So, um, good. Great. So this gives us a great understanding of where folks are coming from. And we're going to give you all uh, several more opportunities throughout the next hour and a half to provide us with your experiences and some more specific questions that we'll have for you. So at this time, I'm going to move it forward, and we'll let you, Ed, take us through some of the background research on this topic of assessment literacy. Right. Thanks, Elizabeth. Yeah, as Elizabeth said, I want to touch on a little bit now the some of, some of the sources that we drew on for our assessment literacy standards. Uh, it's not like there hasn't been work done in this area, because it certainly has, and some going on today that, that that's really exciting as well. But uh, um, uh, this, is, this is just uh, um, a, uh, a summary of, of, of some of the points, and I, I, I noted in the PowerPoint presentation the last three or four slides actually have the references. Uh, you'll notice like Stiggins 1998A, well in the, in, the, uh, in the concluding slides you'll be able to actually see the references here. So uh, Rick, Rick defines assessment literacy for teachers or defined it at that point as uh, an understanding of what assessment methods to use in order to gather dependable data, communicate assessment results effectively, and understand how to use assessment to maximize student motivation and learning. Um, the, um, one, of, one of the prime um, uh, examples of, of prior work are the uh, American Federation of Teachers, National Council on Measurement and Education, uh, National Education Association standards. Um, uh, Susan Brookhart has written about these uh, both uh, around 1990 and then again uh, in 2011. Um, and, uh, uh, in, in the 2011 citation uh, indicated publications that uh, uh, where, where, the, where the AFT, NCME, NEA standards had been cited, uh, that they'd been used in textbooks on assessment for teachers, uh, and of course a study had been prepared to address those. Um, uh, they, they talked about um, uh, the two trends that, that uh, on the horizon from, from the standards that were written in 1990, and that is the work on defining and teaching formative assessment, uh, uh, shifting away from an exclusive focus on summative assessment, and then, and then uh, touching on standards-based reform uh, to focus on, on educational outcomes. Uh, these are some of the skills that were listed. Uh, I'm not going to read them all. I'll just pause for a second and let you read them. Um, these are, are the, the skills that were identified in 1990 uh, for teachers to be assessment literate. And I think you'll see that these are fairly common. Um, I, I particularly uh, appreciated number seven, recognizing unethical, illegal, and otherwise inappropriate assessment methods and uses. Too often, I think that that we've identified the things that people should do, but but haven't warned them about the things that shouldn't be done. And uh, of course, it may be out of the hands of the teacher. It may be an administrator or a board board member that's doing those things. But still, I think it's important that we identify the things that should be done with assessment and the things that shouldn't be done. Um, Stiggins in a, in a, in, in, in Chipui, uh, in, a, in a later document, uh, identified five keys to quality assessment, clear assessment purpose, clear assessment targets, sound assessment design, effective communication, and student involvement. Uh, they created a series of rubrics. Uh, we use that in workshops in Michigan and elsewhere. Uh, helping people uh, as they think through their inventory of assessments, 
then then um, asking the question for each of the assessments that they've listed on their inventory, do they address these five keys to quality, and particularly the sound assessment design, that they rely on sound assessment methods, adequate sampling of the content, the quality of the items are good, and avoid bias and distortion. Um, and those are all terms and concepts that an assessment literate individual needs to know that, uh, um, you know, in terms such as reliability and validity uh, in non-technical ways. We're not talking about statistics, no, no Greek needs to be applied, just the concepts of, of those. Um, Macmillan identified 11 fundamental assessment principles, um, and again, I'll let you read those. Um, and uh, I, I think that that uh, some of these, um, you know, is uh, are, are are perhaps you know requ require a, a elucidation for a teacher. For example, a good assessment is valid. Uh, what is validity in 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 the assessment? Um, the assessment less assessment literate individual tends to think as validity as a characteristic of a test rather than, than evidence to support the uses of the test. Um, and things like uh, good assessment is fair and ethical, well, what does that mean? And so that while these provide good fundamental assessment principles, um, a, a program to teach on assessment would, would help to identify uh, what, what those actually mean. Stiggins in 2009 uh, came up with a, another uh, set of, uh, uh, of questions and, and uh, definition. Um, you know, why assess? Assess what? Assess how? Communicate how and involve students how? Again, related to the, the prior work um, uh, that, that he had uh, identified um, uh, you know, a couple of slides prior. Uh, the, these really kind of lay out uh, some additional ideas related to that. Brookhart, as I indicated, has 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 done a lot of public publication in terms of assessment standards. Um, the the uh, her work um, in 1990 in the 2011 uh, NCME journal. Uh, that article included a, a list of. Uh, 11 things, 11 topics, if you will, that, 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 or standards that, that, that teachers uh, need. need. Um, here are the first five of those. When you look at some of these concepts, for example, uh, clear learning intentions congruent with both the depth of the content and depth of thinking, um, repertoire of strategies for communicating to students, understand the purposes and uses of the range of available assessment options, and be skilled in using them, should have the skills to analyze classroom questions uh, to determine if they're um, the, the actual specific knowledge and thinking skills required. Here's the next three. Providing effective feedback, descriptive feedback to students, um, construct scoring schemes to quantify student performance, uh, administer external assessments, and interpret their results, and then and then be able to uh, articulate the, the assessment results uh, to the student and his or her family, the class, the school, and the community. Um, and then helping students to use the assessment information, and then carry out their legal and ethical responsibilities in assessment as they conduct their work. So that, again, it reiterates the, the, the standards that she had previously published. Another group that had, had done work in this area is the Council of Chief State School Officers uh, Interstate uh, uh, Teacher Assessment and Support Consortium, INTASC. Uh, they devoted an entire standard, standard six, uh, to the issue of, of, of assessment literacy for initial teacher certification. Uh, and they had uh, uh, nine standards uh, for performance, uh, knowledge, uh, seven standards, and critical dispositions, uh, six standards. And uh, 
this one was of interest to the Mac, and so we did a crosswalk between our standards and the INTAS standard 6, done at separate times and without reference to one another, but they showed considerable overlap, and that was pleasing. We had some in ours that INTAS did not, and INTAS had some that were not in ours. Um, and then finally, uh, assessment literacy is, was, has been touched on in other places. Uh, the National Assessment Governing Board had an effort that Jim Popham helped to carry out, defining assessment literacy needs of parents. Um, they had a, a plan under underway to to prepare material to help um, uh, parents become more assessment literate. I understand that that's been put on the back burner. I don't I don't know if that's true or not. It's only hearsay. But uh, the National Board of Professional Teacher Standards also uh, defined assessment literacy. Uh, Susan Brookhart helped them with that. The National Council on Accreditation of Teacher Education did, and as did Advanced Ed, uh, and uh, individuals that you know between Jim, uh, beyond Jim Popham and, and Susan Brookhart, uh, uh, I recently saw the work of Gotcha in the NCME, I think, publication, and he's done some interesting work as well. So you know, basically, uh, a summary of this: there's there's a lot of overlap across the standards in recent definitions. Uh, that that definitions have expanded over time, uh, so that that uh, the, the the skills required of, of educators and others have grown, and I think uh, because there's a greater need for us for understanding assessment literacy and and its potential to improve student achievement, and then I think finally, um, and thankfully that that the definitions of assessment literacy um, tend to um, uh, put more emphasis on the use of formative assessment as opposed to exclusive focus on summative assessments to help move students toward learning targets. And, and so I think that, that those are also all useful uh, bases of information. Um, so at this point, I want to talk to uh, some of the uh, current assessment literacy practices. And I'm going to focus a lot on what the Michigan Assessment Consortium has done, because that's stuff that I've been involved with. But I think that, uh, you know, based a little bit on, on uh, uh, you know, again, the context, uh, I think I think that, that data plays a larger role in assessment literacy than in the past. I think there are research-based practices, uh, the database decision-making, or as... Look, I, I, I totally forgot. I was... I signed up for it. This is called uh, assessment literacy. They do standards. They create it. I'm going to send you the documentation. Could everyone please make sure you mute your lines? Okay. Uh, and and I, I think that you know the the emphasis on data based decision making has has increased the need for assessment literacy, so that it. It, as we're trying to figure out what to make, how to how to use the the data that's collected to, to 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 derive meaningful information, we need to understand the measures that were used to create the 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 data in the first place, uh, particularly when it comes to student achievement. And then I think accountability is certainly something that that has has loomed large in American education for the last 15 years. And although I think that there's a hope that that this will change. Um, uh, I think in reality what, what we have is a situation where uh, the, the ESSA provides opportunities for states to modify their assessment system and accountability system. It, it has turned back, I think, the clock to a pre-NCLB era where states and local districts struggled a lot with what's the current balance of assessment accountability for our state and seems to open up the uh, opportunity for more such discussion. But I think accountability isn't going to go away, and and uh, summative assessment isn't going to go away either. So our, our focus on on creating more balance in a, in a assessment is really to try and in, improve the use of of al of alternatives such as assessment that occur in the classroom, both summative and formative classroom based assessment. And I think that that the the adoption of college and career ready standards, whether it is the the, the national definition or some variant of that or states own standards, 
I think has has really built in a focus on on student progress or growth relative to, lear to, to learning, and so that adds even more complexity uh, to assessment literacy. Well, I've mentioned the Michigan Assessment Consortium several times. Let me tell you a little bit about us. Uh, we're a professional organization uh, of educators, uh, primarily from local and intermediate school districts, some from the, the Michigan Department of Education, some from universities such as Michigan State, um, who have been working for about a decade uh, to improve the quality and use of, of assessment in the state and, and the nation. Uh, we believe in uh, quality education depends on accurate, balanced, and meaningful assessment, and that uh, we, have, we have worked uh, for the last five or six years to advance assessment literacy. We're all aware of basically a volunteer organization, so a lot of the work that might be done by uh, with, a, with a federal or state grant uh, in a short order uh, have taken us a longer period of time because it's when we can get, get time to, to work on it. But it is something that we value and therefore, um, uh, you know, and so uh, one of the projects of, of the, the Michigan Assessment Consortium has been this assessment literacy standards and assessment learning uh, development project. Another one that we work on is the formative assessment for Michigan educators um, uh, project. We, we collect information on the learning of teachers and students, uh, formative assessment practice. Um, I noticed that on the parking lot there's a web address for the Michigan Assessment Consortium.org. Uh, you can find out more information about the MAC uh, at that site and see some of the other projects that we're working on as well as this one. Our goal with the assessment literacy standards was really to, to provide a common basis for work. Uh, we felt that before we could increase somebody's assessment literacy, we had a kind of an understanding of what it was. And uh, although we work primarily with in-service programs, uh, Michigan's universities operate independently of the state board and the State Department of Education and pretty much uh, one another. So that our, our, our while we hope that some of this will be picked up by universities, uh, there's no uh, official mechanism for that to occur other than somebody thinks it's a good idea. Uh, as we got to working, we thought that uh, assessment literacy fell into three arenas, dispositions or beliefs, uh, knowledge and performance or skills. That is, uh, uh, you need to know something about assessment, uh, know what it can do and what it can't do, the types of assessment, the uses of it, the purposes of it, the users of it, uh, the manners in which it can be used and which it shouldn't be. But also, you need to have skill in doing that. It's not enough to just know. You need to be able to apply that knowledge. And then hopefully will result from that is a dis disposition that uh, assessment can be used constructively. And I want to do that. I want to learn more about it. And so that um, the three things working together are what comprise our definition of, of, of assessment literacy. Separate standards were developed for students and separate for the elementary versus secondary and their parents. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we debated as to whether to have a separate set of standards for parents, but we came to the conclusion that it was important for parents to understand what their, their school-aged children should know and do and believe about assessment, uh, that it would not be appropriate for us to have higher or broader expectations for the, the school age uh, students than their parents. And so we decided to, to leave that alone and not have uh, assessment literacy standards for parents, but instead hoping that parents would be able to know and be able to do and be disposed towards the things that their children would be. We have, we have standards for teachers. Uh, for building administrators, and then separately for district administrators because their responsibilities are different, and then local policymakers and state policymakers. And we identify local policymaker as the, the superintendent and school board, and the state policymaker as the governor, the state board of education, the, and the state legislature. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the last one, state policymaker, I'll have to admit, is the touchiest of all of those to address. Um, by the time you re realize that a legislator needs to be a little bit more assessment literate, it's probably because they've introduced something that is not the greatest piece of legislation. Uh, the development process uh, 
followed this kind of pathway. Um, the work was begun in 2012. We conducted a review of the literature. Various sets of standards, as I've outlined, were examined. Um, initial drafts were created and recreated and reviewed, and that, that took a, a while. And then um, I shared that with, with one individual nationally, and he provided a uh, in-depth um, critical review of those standards. And that focused on whether um, essentially how much of a technical nature might educators be expected to know, to be able to do. Um, and uh, was, was this a set of standards for measurement professionals uh, or a set of standards for practitioners? And, and what that focused on, uh, helped us focus on is thinking about uh, what, are, what are the things that educators need to understand. The concept, for example, of reliability is something for which, of course, there are statistical definitions. But the concept of reliable observation, uh, reliable judgments about whether or not students have learned something or not, are still important. And so uh, we, we included such concepts, but referenced them as a non-technical, uh, non-statistical uh, definitions of such. The second draft then we produced, we reviewed externally. We got Susan Brookhard and Carol Commodore, Margaret Heritage. Uh, Ken O'Connor, uh, Jim Popham, and Rick Stiggins, and they provided us a lot of very useful information, which then we took and created a third draft, and then we, we, we created an in-state review packet and surveyed uh, educators and others in Michigan, uh, and finally uh, finalized the standards and published them uh, in 2015. This is a sample uh, of, a, of a disposition standard. Um, and the, these are just this, this three, three examples. Uh, there are others. Uh, an effective assessment uh, building level administrator should believe that an effective assessment system must balance different purposes for different users and use appropriate assessment methods to, to measure different learning targets. So the balance here, again, is not defined in terms of number of test items, number of minutes, number of tests. Uh, it, it is a, an understanding that assessment of learning that, that, that occurs at the conclusion, regardless of whether the results come back in five minutes or five, five weeks or five months, that summative assessments are a determination of what kids have already learned before they move on to the next unit of instruction. But what are more important are the assessments of, uh, for learning that are occurring as students are learning. And so the balance is to make sure that there's a, there's a more than adequate focus on the assessment for learning that's occurring uh, during instruction. Now, they may be um, you know, things literally taking place within a class period. They may be between class periods, as that graphic uh, at the, uh, at the outset of this presentation illustrated, there might be even quizzes and things that, that feed into teacher decision making about what kids are going to learn and that, that an effective system must balance those. That multiple measures can provide a more balanced picture of a student or school. Now, this is because some people have license to have too much testing. So the question is, um, do the multiple measures contribute to this providing more balanced picture or are they just simply providing redundant information and, and taking up valuable time and money? Uh, that's a decision that I think uh, the local district needs to do uh, nicely. The U.S. Department of Education has indicated that the secretary letter to states that, that uh, ESSA funds can be used by states and districts to inventory their assessments so that the multiple measures could be, could be looked at. Uh, and, and, and make sure that, that, that they really are valued and, and valuable, not just simply redundant. And that, you know, another disposition is that, that quality assessments are a critical attribute of effective teaching and learning. So that we believe that you know, there are some people that hate assessment. Um, they believe that all assessment is evil, that, that, it, that it causes distortions, and, and, uh, and that the world would be better off if we didn't have tests. Um, I, I think that you know we're not among those. Uh, clearly, uh, we believe that quality assessments can contribute to effective teaching and learning, and so um, 
we're hoping that that building administrators will, will share that. We have knowledge uh, standards for uh, for building level administrators. I've got a, a, a couple of examples. A balanced assessment system consists of both the following. Different users have different assessment purposes, and different assessment purposes may require different assessment methods. Again, a match of, of, of users to purposes and purposes to assessment methods. Uh, and then different types of assessment methods and how do teachers select which one to use. Select a response, construct Again, if, if, if they're creating uh, assessments in, for use in, in their school, uh, understanding the different different types and when they might use those uh, are some of the knowledge uh, standards that building administrators should have. And here are some sample performance standards. And we, we did uh, lay these out in a couple of different ways. Um, and then the, you know, for example, uh, promote assessment literacy for self and staff uh, as part of a promotion of a culture of appropriate assessment practice and then promote the use of assessment data to improve student learning, um, use assessment results including subgroup performance to influence the school's curriculum and instructional program and use multiple sources of data over time to identify trends in learning. So those are just some examples. Of, you've got the complete MAC assessment literacy standards document that you can download and and see all of them. There are about 50 to 55, 60 standards for each of the groups. Some of you might go, whoa, that's a lot. And, it, and indeed it is. Um, in fact, Jim Popham at a, at a national meeting uh, raised that. The way too many standards. How could you possibly? Well, the, the reason why we have so many standards is not because we're unrealistic. It's that we're looking at these as a, as a basis of a long-term assessment learning process and we feel that it's important if you were going to run a one-day workshop on the, the key things you need to know about assessment, you'd want to pick a handful of the standards to try and address. But if you're going to try and address, uh, create a, an assessment learning process where teachers could become assessment specialists and be certified uh, as such, uh, result, resulting from a two-year learning program, then, then a much broader set of standards uh, would be appropriate. And that's why we have so many. So it's not that we're expecting that every one-day workshop or half-day workshop is going to cover all of those. Clearly impossible. In that case, you'd want to prioritize the standards. But what we want you to do is to think about um, what are the, the breadth and depth of, of learning uh, that, that is required. Well, I think we're at a point where we have another uh, question. Um, and uh, Elizabeth, I think you're Wonderful. going to take it. Thanks, Ed. The next question we have really relates to one of the prime outcomes that you've discussed already in thinking about student outcomes. And this is one of the most important reasons that we want folks to be assessment literate. So after hearing about the some of the work that led to Mac's work, as well as thinking about those three areas of knowledge, dispositions, and performance, we'd like you all as participants to think about how can student outcomes improve if educators are improving their assessment knowledge, dispositions, and performance. So we will put another poll up on the screen, give you a few minutes to think about and respond to that question. Again, if you have questions related to the slides that Ed is taking us through, please post those in the parking lot. We'll be sure to respond to as many of those as we can. Um, while you're all thinking about your response to this open-ended question, we'll look at some of the questions that folks asked when they registered for today's event. I think we've gotten through a lot of them, and uh, our presentation addresses quite a few of them. But Ed, I'm wondering if you can um, talk to us a little bit more about, you know, you, you talked in the beginning about this notion of data literacy versus assessment literacy. And um, it might be helpful because we did receive several questions on that topic. Uh, how, one of the questions that gets into a little more detail. How might each type of literacy assist educators as they make instructional decisions? 
Um, I think you touched on this, but if you have anything else to say on that. Well, I, I think that um, one, of, one of the points I'd like to make about um, you know, the, the, the concept of data-driven decisions um, suggests that we collect a pile of data, we plop it on somebody's desk and say, now tr try and figure out what you can make of this. Um, I think uh, Dylan Lim has, has talked about, uh, uh, you know, ba basically decision-driven driven, uh, data collection. That is, that we decide what it is we want uh, to know and, for, and then we collect data to help drive that decision which I think makes it a whole lot easier. And I think the same principle applies to with assessment literacy, that if, that if we have a sense of what it is we're trying to find out, then <clears throat> we can ask ourselves what's, what's the, the, the best uh, or best approaches uh, to collecting data to help address that. Uh, so if a teacher is, is trying to determine if, if individual students in a class <clears throat> have learned something that they're teaching so that they can decide whether they can safely move on, and expand upon that, or need to go back over some of the concepts, uh, some of the techniques that might be used would be things like a whiteboard, or having students uh, write their response to a brief question that the teacher then looks at and plans tomorrow's uh, uh, lesson, uh, etc. So that that um, I think that in in the case of uh, the assessment literate teacher is thinking about, you know. Why, why am I assessing? What am I trying to find out? And then what are the best methods uh, for carrying out that assessment that's most likely to be able to help me answer my question in the, in, with the least amount of effort and the least amount of time um, away from teaching? Uh, and, and that, I think, is going to uh, make it, make it uh, a more productive sort of thing for teachers and, and for students. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of what what goes on in formative assessment practice is, that, is trying to get students more engaged in their own self-assessment, self-improvement activity, and and that's that's difficult, particularly in 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 school settings where students have not had a lot of practice on that, where they rely on the teacher to tell them whether or not they've learned something. That is, they give them a test, um, and 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 uh, and then grade it, um, but that that's not not getting into um, uh, in, into the whole area of, of, help, of helping students uh, learn, learn uh, about their own level of achievement and, and be motivated to try and improve that. And that, 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 takes, that takes time and effort. That's a nice segue back into the responses to our question on the screen right now. Um, Folks have resoundingly replied that the instruction, teaching, and learning can improve, um, and thus outcomes for students can improve if educators are more assessment literate. And mm -hmm. um, there's some examples here that different folks offer. Um, as we get down into the responses, we note that the question becomes then how? How do we ensure that there's time and attention given to this? And I know you'll talk a little bit more about this and how some of the work that Mac has done with the survey and how that can be used in schools and how that can be used as a professional development tool. And you did also share with us just a moment ago how this is viewed as a long-term approach to mm -hmm. professional learning. The I, one I mean, my sense thing is that yeah, I, I look at, at the response that Dan Huffman put in here, and I, that that he's pointed out a real issue, and it, and this is how ass assessment illiterate administrators have a negative impact on the assessment literacy learning of teachers. Uh, he said, my sense is that the real challenge is helping educational leaders make room for teachers to develop and practice assessment literacy. In too many districts, the culture and conditions that exist do not support meaningful assessment practice. How do we fix this? Well, I think one way to fix it is is to help teachers become more assessment literate because hopefully if they don't forget it when they go back to, to, to college for their administrator degree, they'll have some assessment literacy experiences that they can draw from as ad administrators. Um, I, I think this is a real issue because the lack of, of, of attention to assessment in, in, in uh, I, I, think, I think now we're attending more to data 
and data literacy in administrator programs, but not assessment literacy. And so to, it, 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 is, it is frustrating because this is a educational system. It's not something where teachers can decide to do something on their own and administrators ignore that. Um, I, I think what we're going to try in Michigan uh, is, is to really find good models of administrator uh, understanding and use of assessment practice and then highlight those and use those because I think this is this is both a motivational issue, uh, motivating administrators to want to learn about assessment, um, and and uh, uh, and then showing them how how to do so. And and so we're as as I'll get into a little bit later, our assessment learning uh, process um, is designed to, to to basically take administrators wherever they are and moving them towards becoming more assessment literate. So some will want the pamphlet, some will want the two semester program, um, and all the places in between. But I think that if, if we can show them schools that have uh, improved performance of students by, by virtue of the, the assessment practice that, that are used, and I'm not talking about the state tests, I'm not talking about the commercial purchase test, I'm talking about the practice of the teachers, then I hope that this will serve as motivation to others. I hope, as I said, if, if we can be, help our pre-service teachers become more assessment literate, that eventually the, the problem won't go away unless there's some selective amnesia that occurs uh, upon entry into an administrator program. So again, it's a long-term concerted effort among all stakeholders, starting with those who are instructing pre-service teachers, continuing in the in school and in district professional learning, and mm -hmm. carrying through an educator's career. Um, right. I, I think you'll go into more detail on those different pieces, but I think uh, we're seeing that, that folks value this and are seeing it happening in their settings. Um, and we hope to give some more thoughts on that as we move forward. At this time, I'm going to move us ahead into a section on the topic in practice. So you'll talk to us a little bit more about the MAC self-assessment. Right. Thank you again. Um, we realized uh, that we needed, to, we needed data if we were going to talk to, to individuals about becoming more assessment literate. Um, we we share, show the the standards to people, and they say, "Oh, yeah, I'm I'm assessment literate." They they glance at it, takes them two three minutes, and um, but we realize that that there's some depth of knowledge inherent in particularly the knowledge standards and even in the performance standards, um, and that uh, in in order to really assess where people are at, that that uh, we needed to build these self assessments. And keeping in mind, there are about 50 standards for each group. Um, we then we then set about uh, creating uh, assessment literacy self assessments um, for students, for teachers, for building administrators, district administrators, and local policymakers. And um, we've done um, the the teacher building and district administrators and and local policymakers part. Um, I'm not sure what we'll do with state policymakers because that is. Uh, is, it is difficult to provide assessment literacy uh, information when legislation is pending, as it is in many of our states. But uh, we'll get to that. And and um, we um, our, our thinking was at the time that that if we could create the uh, the 50 item version of this, that we could create a short form or or condensed version. Um, these might be posted on a website. Uh, uh, might be something along the line of uh, are 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 you assessment literate question mark and then having the having the individuals take 20 questions and and uh, for each of them there would be an explanation of of the uh, what the correct answer is for each incorrect answer why it's incorrect and so it would become kind of an interesting challenge and a, an awareness of what assessment literacy is maybe help to collect some information and provide a little bit of assessment literacy development uh, for the users. So that was kind of our motivation in this, but we wanted to start with the, the pool of items. So um, 
from that then uh, for workshops such as this, we've created kind of a condensed version, uh, taking 20 of the standards that we felt were most important for teachers and building administrators and district administrators, then, then this 20 item self-assessment uh, could be used uh, as a kind of a warm-up activity and workshops and that. And we've made that assessment available to you. So you can take that and, and uh, you may want to use it for groups you work with. Um, and that's, that's the uh, other document that we posted beyond the standards. So I, I think that I'm going to share with you some sample questions. Call, always uh, dangerous. Uh, what do you mean? It's not, it's not, C is not the correct answer. D is. Oh, yeah, well, I, I realize that there's always that kind of danger in these sorts of things, but so be it. Um, and I don't even know if C is the correct answer to this first one, but this is a sample disposition question. Again, um, thinking about a teacher, building administrator, district administrator. Um, you know, what, what is the most important characteristic of a balanced assessment system? Okay, A. There are people that think that that means the equal number of times of assessment of each type. Um, that those used, the assessments used for school accountability are given the highest priority. Uh, classroom assessments are given the highest priority or the information needs of all users are considered equally and important and are met. And I believe that D is the correct answer. Um, but you can have some interesting discussions about each of those. And that's, I think you'll see that as you go through these that um, they could provide some interesting discussion topics for groups who want to learn more about assessment, say parents, for example. Uh, a sample knowledge question. What is the definition of formative assessment? Short tests given multiple times during the school year, that's an interim assessment. Sets of item, test items available in an item bank, oftentimes used for interim or benchmark assessments, not formative. Activities used during instruction to determine whether students learn what they were just taught, yes. And an assessment that is given at the end of each marking period for grading students, uh, another type of interim assessment, not formative assessment. And there are two types of performance uh, questions, and I'll show you the first type, and uh, which really get at, you know, are, it's almost attitudinal or knowledge, uh, and then the other is how often uh, individuals actually carry out these activities. But what's the most effective way for a building administrator to interpret achievement results and create improvement goals with staff? Demand teachers improve instructional practice? No, I don't think so. Lead dialogues with staff in each of the content areas assessed. Tell teachers what they need to, to do to improve and publicly announce high and low performing classrooms in the school. Probably B is the correct answer to that one, I hope. Um, and then Here's, here's the example of the other type of, of performance question, which is how often they've, they've carried out uh, certain activities. These are just two samples. Assisted teachers in collaboratively analyzing and using data in a professional learning community. None, once, twice, three times, etc. In the, in the past 12 months, have you led your school, and this is a, another subtype of, of performance, use assessment data to reflect on the effectiveness of teachers' instructional strategies. And those are, tend to be answered with a yes or no. Um, so that again, there's a series of each of these two types as well within the performance questions within each of the full assessment literacy self-assessments, but also um, <clears throat> for uh, that. Uh, Cheryl Finley asked the question whether states have done assessment literacy training for state legislators. Um, I'm not aware, Cheryl, if, if they have uh, recently, but one that I was involved with a while ago that, that involved the UCLA CREST, the National Center of Research on Evaluation Standards and Student Testing, uh, worked with um, uh, legislators and legislative staff uh, from the, the National Conference of State Legislators, uh, and we provided uh, a half-day session on assessment literacy. It was on a Saturday afternoon in Annapolis, Maryland, when there was a home football game at the Naval Academy, a beautiful day. This was the end of a three or four day conference. Um, the room was packed. Uh, the janitor had to kick us out because he wanted to go home at the end of the day. These legislators were very, very interested in it. Last January, I, uh, a year ago, I spent uh, uh, half a day with some, some brand new legislators talking about assessment purposes, sharing some of the uh, 
what what I think are the standards for state policymakers with them, and they were very interested in that. Um, I think the the challenge is that oftentimes we as educators realize that state policymakers need to become more assessment literate when some piece of legislation is introduced or somebody is quoted in the newspaper and, and it's challenging them to, to carry it out in that, uh, that way. Uh, assessment isn't necessarily on the top of, of anybody's list of things they want to learn more about it in a state legislature, but I think it, it, it can be done. Uh, and of course, uh, with local school boards, a number of the key decisions being made about assessment in districts um, bubble up to the or down from the the local school board, and so uh, we're in the process of trying to create resources that that can be used and 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 to enlist our our state uh, policy groups um, like, like the school board association, school school administrators association, uh, in helping with delivery of that. So again, as I indicated, the self-assessments are designed to intrigue users about their current level of assessment literacy, uh, finding out more, um, uh, inform them about areas where knowledge or practice may fall short, um, again, hoping that they will seek to become more assessment literate. Of course, there's always the danger of they could say, ah, who needs to know this stuff? Um, but, I, but I think that, that um, you know, and then hopefully, encourage them to begin and sustain a journey to become more assessment literate. And I call it a journey because in reaction to the standards, a couple of the national experts have said, well, we have this program and we have this uh, process. And I think those are great. And, and, and some people will benefit from those. But, but I think one of the things that when we think about helping uh, students or teachers, administrators, local and state policymakers to become assessment literate, I think we have to think about different strategies. There are some people that just want to know just a little bit more. And to say that they have to attend a, a, a 12 session, 36 hour process in order to become just a little bit more assessment literate is probably not going to happen. But there are some people that that, that brochure or pamphlet is, is just an enticement to get more heavily involved in a longer, more sustained effort. and so. That's what I hope happens, that, that, that we can entice uh, these groups and individuals to begin that journey that, that will take years and, and will include a lot, of, uh, a, a lot of effort on their part to become more assessment literate, to practice the skills, to incorporate those as they change positions from teachers to administrators, that they don't forget about all of that practice that, they, that was used in the classroom. They remember that and build on it as, as, as administrators. So that, you know, one of the things that, that I think a key question is this one. And uh, I think, Mark, uh, I'm sorry, Elizabeth, uh, taking through that, right? Yes, absolutely. So what we're interested in finding out now is after you've heard about this assessment literacy self-assessment that Ed described, and I will remind you that it's available for download down at the bottom of your screen. So that is open for use. Uh, we're wondering what you've heard today or if you have familiarity with the self-assessment already. How do you think it can aid your school or district? So using this with your educators, what are some of the outcomes that you could see in the use um, and interpretation of those results? Be wonderful too if there are any folks who are using the self-assessment currently to describe how your school or district might be using it. And maybe Ed, you can also share with us some examples of the schools or districts that you've worked with that have used this tool effectively. Yeah, I, I, I presented it in February at a conference in Ann Arbor and uh, we actually had uh, uh, individuals, uh, we had a an internet-based kind of clicker system, and uh, uh, it, w it was it, it which provided a display of, of the answers uh, given while while people were sitting in the audience, um, and uh, rather than just quietly um, uh, sit there and 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 say I don't know what the right answer is, 
uh, people were responding, but doing so in an anonymous way so as not to embarrass anyone. And I, and I think it, it you know, for example, there's a lot of uh, confusion about the, the, the term reliability and validity. And uh, when, you, when you ask about those, um, uh, it, it, in, in this way it showed up because it, that question had a, you know, half, half had this definition, half had the other, and, and, and we were able then, as we, as we presented, to, um, to, to, to show that. Uh, we're, we're hoping to put all of the self-assessments into this system. I don't remember the name of it, but uh, making it a, all of them available for use uh, in workshops. Uh, again, I think that, that the, the questions will, will actually get m more in depth. Um, uh, I, I've seen other approaches to, to writing questions that are good. Uh, that I don't want to portray that the Mac's the only one that's done this, clearly not. Um, I know the folks in Oregon have done some things. Um, I think anything where you can get people to actually, within, within a workshop, answer questions. And, and the thing I liked about the approach that we used is it displayed the results anonymously so that some there was 100% agreement on the correct answer and others it was like 30% uh, answered correctly and we were able to uh, clearly identify that. So um, I, I think that, um, you know, the, our, our hope is eventually to turn these into something that could be posted on the internet uh, so that, that they would be widely available. Uh, again, one of the things that, that we have to do, and I'll touch on this in the next section, is that when you get people interested enough uh, or perhaps perturbed enough about what they don't know about assessment, it's not enough just to leave it there. You've got you to be able to offer them some ideas on how they could improve their, their understanding and use of, of assessment. Um, but I think that these tools uh, could be used uh, to get people engaged in that process and, and thinking about it. And that is exactly what folks are saying here in their responses, that the results of a self-assessment could really help structure priorities for PD and thinking about both individual and group strengths and weaknesses over a period of time, what could be addressed in terms of making improvements. Um, I'll me, give you a second me, to okay. look through there. Yeah, let, let, let me put a... Um, uh, plug in, and if, if you use the standards or the self-assessment, uh, would love I would love to know how it how it went, even if you have data, because um, again I we have data for people in Michigan, but I don't have data from places outside of Michigan. So if if you administer it or use it, uh, if you have ways of of uh, providing me data or feedback on the standards, what we've missed. What, what you think shouldn't be in there, uh, we would be very, very interested in that. Ed, there's a good question from Melissa over in the parking lot. Uh, she asks, would there be an overall assessment literacy score? So when someone takes a self-assessment, is there an overall score that they would receive? Um, we hadn't really thought of that. It was really more of a, you know, 20 individual items selected to be the most important parts of the assessment literacy standards. Um, I, I think that that uh, um, I, I know every time you put 20 questions out, somebody wants to, to a total score, and then somebody's going to want to know what the per, their percentile rank is of the score. And that's uh, we weren't uh, uh, really interested in, in going that far. Uh, you may want to. Um, and certainly we might do that if, if we were writing a grant for grant funding or something. That was another part of our motivation, uh, and I'll touch on this in the next section, in creating those self-assessments was to be able to collect data that we could use in, in a grant. Um, you know, usually if, if you write a statement like the following, um, teachers are, 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 you know, few, few teachers are assessment literate you'd be challenged, uh, well, what support do you have for that? And so part of that, part of the motivation for developing the self-assessments was to be able to fill in that uh, because, and then data. Um, although I don't know that we would, we would report it as a total score, probably more likely uh, um, here, here are some key concepts 
that the teachers or administrators or students or te uh, uh, have that, uh, and uh, therefore uh, funding for assessment literacy development uh, should occur. Um, I, you know, like I said, um, you know, uh, the I think the value of the self-assessment is the information that each of the question gives rather than a total score. So. And as you mentioned, and several of our participants are mentioning, that it's really a starting point for evaluating where mm -hmm. folks are and then using that as a, a conversation starter and, and right. having good quality discussions about what this means to each of those folks. Mm -hmm. And, and, I, and I know, think that, that can that, go a long way with right. fostering. And, and, uh, I, I think part of the problem with the 50 to 60 item self-assessment is not the sort of thing that you would hand out at the start of a workshop and, and uh, you'd, you'd be spending half or more of the workshop with people filling it out. Uh, and if you had, you know, more than more than an hour to 75 minutes, then you might, might like if it was a half day or full day workshop, that might make sense. Um, you might even be able to use it pre-post and determine at the end of the workshop are people's performance on the individual items or the total score uh, better. But um, I think that, that uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I, I have found that when people actually take it, it, it really helps them operationalize the standards and they think much more specifically about the standard rather than glancing at it and saying, oh, sure, I'm, I can do that. What you just noted there, Kay responded and said she would use this as a pre-post for pre-service teachers in their assessment course. So, mm -hmm. uh, like-minded. Sure. Yeah. All right. Well, let's move I, right I, into I'm the pleased, next section. I'm pleased to see that there is an assessment course in which it could be used pre and post. That's good. <laughs> yeah, uh, wonderful. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. We're going to move on to talking a little bit more about how this um, can work with educators. Yeah, I, I think that... that uh, you know, the, there are a lot of assumptions that, that that built into this work, and I wanted to lay those out so as not to, um, you know, that that the assumption is that it, if there's work done in identifying the knowledge, performance, and and dispositional standards that educators need to know, and if and if more of the educators know and can do more of that, and do more with assessment, the assumption is instruction will be improved. Um, Classroom assessment will occur more often and more effectively. Students will be more engaged in their own learning. Students will learn more and perhaps learn differently. And student achievement will increase. Uh, there, there's limited research evidence to support these hope for assertions and assumptions. However, I did want to lay them out because I, I think that um, if, if we want to, to support this kind of work, if, if you're in a situation where you've got skeptical administrators or, or local policymakers that, that don't believe that this is a valuable sort of thing to engage in, it would be very helpful to be able to uh, provide information that, that you know, a, 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 an, an improved uh, version of classroom assessment will be used, uh, that, that we can teach uh, teachers to work with students to get, get students more engaged in their own learning uh, and that the, the ultimate result of this the, it will be an improvement in, in achievement. Um, I, I think that the effective learning of, of formative assessment practice will lead to improved student achievement uh, and it, it, although it's difficult to, to parcel out these sorts of things. Um, uh, to, to be able to show that, but that that again is my hope. But it's a, but it is a, 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 a an assumption of this work that that I think that we need uh, as a profession to to work towards trying to address. Um, I've talked about the extent of pre-service uh, learning, and um, we there there are a couple of challenges inherent in this, and I. Uh, I'm still an adjunct at, at Michigan State, have on the faculty for five years, and now 
sort of adjunct and uh, and and not teaching there. But the um, one of the things that I found in conversations with with colleagues is that the exact extent of pre-service learning about assessment is not known, and that's because at a university, more so than in K-12, individual instructors determine what they teach, and how much they teach it, and how much they emphasize it in their class work, their uh, lectures, their the, the uh, other other work associated with the class, and so that um, in conversations with 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 faculty, I could I I could not uncommon here. Oh yeah, I I teach assessment. Um, now I know that there were a couple of people whose instruction on assessment was large scale summative assessment is bad. <laughs> That's all you need to know about assessment. Well, I know that there are others who are very thoughtful teachers of of uh, formative assessment practice, and that that pre-service teachers from those faculty members learned a lot. They saw it in evidence in their uh, in, in instruction, and they saw it in in uh, um, uh, in, in, and had a chance to practice that when they were doing their student teaching. So one of the one of the challenges in determining, you know, what is the extent of pre-service learning about assessment, is is that there isn't really a clearly defined measure of assessment teaching and student assessment competence in higher higher education institutions. And and as I said in my third bullet, this means that different instructors could correctly indicate, I teach assessment to my students yet provide them very different instructional learning opportunities. And so I, I, if this is something that I think is, is needed. Um, I, I think it has to be addressed from the perspective of what the higher ed faculty are teaching and what are the learning opportunities and experiences. And then, and then what are students saying that they're learning? And, and they will not be the same. Uh, I know from work on surveys of enacted curriculum that we carried out 20 or so years ago, we collected information from teachers and from students, and you'd find that teachers would say things like, oh, yeah, we have a lot of student-led uh, uh, learning opportunities. They're actively engaged in their own learning. You'd ask students, and they'd say, no, the teacher just lectured all the time. Um, and so it, it's important. Uh, I, it's it's an area that, that I, I really want to work on to try and create something that would be kind of a self-assessment of a, of a college faculty, um, so that that um, they they could uh, uh, assess uh, themselves uh, and and get a sense of of, of where they're at, um, and so you know we 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 hope that 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 work will occur. One of, one of the models that, that Rick Stiggins and I worked on for such pre-service learning and assessment by teachers was really kind of a three three part process. Um, one is that college students would see the faculty members using the practices that that faculty members might want their those students to use when they were te became teachers. That is that we would see them being used. That's challenge number one. Challenge number two is that, that students would take a course on classroom assessment, both summative approaches to assessment in the classroom and formative approaches to, to assessment in the classroom. And thirdly, that they would have supervised student teaching experience um, supervised by assessment trained content people. So that if you were preparing to be a secondary science teacher, someone with a science education background who also was assessment literate would be working with you to design um, assessment uh, lessons and practices embedded within the instruction that you're learning to provide to students. And that, that that's the three-part process would help pre-service teachers. So that, that suggests some areas in which we might do, might do surveys uh, of college faculty and students. I wanted to touch on a couple of things that though there were a couple of you that were interested in approaches for applying sort of assessment literacy for educators who work with students with disabilities and those who work with English learners. And the Council of Chief State School Officers has uh, uh, several state collaboratives on assessment student standards or SCAS groups. 
um, and uh, they they work in areas such as formative assessment. It's called, and Margaret Heritage is the facilitator of that. Um, it's called formative assessment for students and teachers, and state education agencies and other organizations can join that. So the Michigan Department of Education has joined for the state of Michigan, but the Michigan Assessment Consortium has joined in as an associate member. And one of the things that, that the, uh, the SCAS FAST group and the ACES, the Assessing Special Education Students SCAS group have done is, is to um, sponsor the development of a new electronic uh, document called Formative Assessment for Students with Disabilities, written by Susan Brookhard and Cheryl Lazarus. Cheryl is a researcher with the National Center on Educational Outcomes at the University of Minnesota. And uh, the goal is really to show how formative assessment can be learned by those who teach students with disabilities, uh, any of the, you know, the range of, of severity of their of disability and also uh, in, the, in the, the various settings in which they might be taught. So it would be suitable for general education, special education, resource rooms, et cetera. And then a comparable publication has already been created by educators who work with English learners uh, and um, uh, Robert LaQuante and, uh, and then Margaret Heritage and a colleague have created a more extensive document uh, uh, through WIDA uh, for um, the use of formative assessment practice by, by teachers who work with English learners. So I wanted to mention those as well. Um, and uh, um, then, then um, let's see, that uh, I guess I've touched on this already. So I, th I think that these are resources that, that will be available generally. Um, CCSSO.org is the, is, will eventually be the place where where these documents reside and members or non-members uh, will, will be able to get access to them. So I think we've come, come a long way in the last hour and a half. Um, I, I think now is time for another question. Um, and uh, I think it's time for you to, to reflect a little bit also on, on what you've learned today. Absolutely. So. As we're coming to the end of our presentation today, uh, as we mentioned early on, one of our goals with this series and with this particular webinar is to have you think about how you would use the information that you've learned. And we want you to reflect a little bit on the vision of assessment literacy that you're coming away with or that has been enhanced through today's presentation, where essential components of teacher habit and practice are critical. And how do you think that you can take that into your schools and districts and help this vision of assessment be realized among the educators you work with? So we'll put up another poll. I know we ask you a lot of questions, but it's important for us to help you think about the topics that we're discussing. And we are very interested also in how you might apply this learning. And Ed, I know you said in reference to the work that CCSSO has done that um, some of it is available. I think some of it is forthcoming. Canvas is asking in the parking lot if we have an idea of that. And I think what we can do um, either in the next couple minutes before we break the webinar, we can see if the link is available. And uh, if not, not we can make that part of the archive. The, the formative assessment for students with disabilities publication is not yet available because we're trying to iron out some permissions of teachers that we video recorded uh, here in Michigan. And uh, uh, by the time CCSO asked for the parent consent, I think the building principal had discarded them. So we're, we're trying to go back and, and obtain those. And then that's, that's the last stumbling block. Our, our goal is to make it available by the end of June. Okay, very good. Frustrating, but but anyway, the the English learner uh, publication, which was the uh, publication of the SCAS English language learner group, and also the FAST group, uh, Robert Linguanti, I think finished that about six to nine months ago, and I assume it would be available. I've not looked for sure, but I assume it would be available at ccsso.org. The two uh, two C's, two S's, and an O. dot O R G.
Wonderful. We'll see if we can get that link with, posted for folks. Time whether we ought to sh shift to the to the last set of slides and then open it up for questions. Yeah, we'll give folks just a minute or two to respond to this question. I think we're doing pretty good on time. I know some folks might have to leave, but we're we're doing well. So taking a look there at some of the responses that are coming in, um, it looks like Pennsylvania is doing some work in this area already. Dion is sharing some of the work with principals that's being done there. I don't know if it was intentional to highlight the word time, but I think that that is always an issue that we hear across the board. Whenever we talk about educator learning, we hear, where's the time? How do I find the time? Um, time is a very valuable resource that we find is lacking. Well, and I think the the ability to work together uh, as, a, as a team within a building is even more precious. I mean, it's one thing for individual teachers to find time to pursue something, but if you if, if a school team would work together to become more assessment literate, to examine the, the assessments that are being used, determine which ones ought to be continued, and perhaps which ones ought to be added, uh, that kind of time is even more precious. Jason offers um, an interesting piece here with regard to coaching. Um, so extending beyond your PLCs and your more traditional professional development experiences, and taking this assessment literacy into the coaching conversations right. and relationships. And I think that that's certainly a good way to move along the spectrum of learning for teachers. Mm -hmm. Different folks are mentioning leadership and you talked about that really from the outset that getting leaders on board with understanding assessment literacy and, and valuing that is critical to making changes at the school level. And, and it's one of the major hindrances too, when you have administrators who don't understand this, why it's important. Deborah makes a good point also on the use of data and ensuring that that is um, being done well. I think that that carries into work with parents and mm -hmm. not just educators. Right. And let Legislators understand assessment literacy, become assessment literate is a, is a key need. See, folks are still formulating some responses, but we'll give just about 20 seconds or so for people to round out their answers. I'll also note that the transcripts of each of these polls that we've asked today, along with the responses, will be available when we post the archive of today's event. So um, if you see great ideas and um, maybe miss jotting those down, those will be available. Yeah, we have one, one person wondering who has the doggies. Is that you? Those are my dogs. They are <laughs> upset about something outside, I think. It's the assessment illiteracy. That's what they're upset about. <laughs> <laughs> Uh. All right, we'll move this one right off the screen and we'll get into that last little section where we talk about um, some of your suggestions for action steps. Right. And I've, I've already touched on the first one. I didn't realize that at the time, but you know, the, the, the three-part uh, pre-service teacher program that, that Rick and I had talked about was to observe and model the use of effective assessment practices at the university level. 
that might be the most challenging of these three recommendations. Um, there are faculty members that haven't changed how they've taught students in, in, in decades, and that they probably won't model the good practices that we want teachers to see. But hopefully other, other faculty members will. I believe that, that there should be a course on classroom assessment, uh, both summative and formative, uh, so that, that teachers do learn some of those knowledge kinds of things. But the practice of it, I mean, ironically, that student teaching provides such an ideal opportunity for prospective teachers to not only plan lessons and, and learn to do, deliver them effectively, but also to um, uh, build in uh, assessment-related activities, uh, both formative and summative, in, in the lessons. Of course, if the classroom teacher is not assessment literate and if the supervisor from the university is not particularly assessment literate, which is the case in, too often, then, then it's a missed opportunity. And so the proposal that I, that I wrote for Michigan State was one of, of teaching these supervisors of the student teachers about assessment as it is applied within their disciplines so that a science teacher is learning about assessment practices in science uh, and, and supervised by a, a science educator who, has, who knows more about assessment than the typical teacher. In, in the uh, pre-service administrator programs, then, then I think that you know, hopefully people will come to the program knowing something about assessment from having been a teacher. At least that's my hope in the future. But I think that providing learning opportunities such as internships and, and, and opportunities and ex expectations for, for uh, learning about assessment. Uh, there has been, as I said, a, a, some, some attempts to get at data literacy for administrators because of their engagement in school improvement activity. I would hope that that would expand and include assessment literacy as well. So that it isn't, it isn't just mindlessly taking the data and figuring out what meaning it has, but thinking about the quality of the data is it trustworthy? Is it is it in other words, reliable? Is it is the data related to the to the purposes of assessment? And is there evidence to support that, which is validity? So that that I hope that that our pre-service administrator programs can can begin to engage people in thinking about assessment. And of course, for in-service teachers, uh, uh, we we need to develop assessment learning opportunities. Uh, the the Michigan Assessment Consortium has is doing that at the introductory level. We're thinking about intermediate and advanced levels. Uh, we want to endorse teacher certificates uh, by creating an assessment specialization, especially in classroom assessment, to recognize the teachers who go beyond the minimum uh, and engage in that. Our goal, a very lofty one for which we have no resources, I'll readily admit, is to, to seek to provide an assessment specialist teacher to every district. Um, and we're now engaged, the MAC is now engaged in this effort, creating an introductory set of modules and designing a credentialing system for assessment specialization. And uh, our goal is to field test the modules this summer and begin to use them uh, statewide, or at least to offer them statewide for use next fall. For in-service administrators, again, developing assessment learning opportunities. Uh, some of the same ones that we're using with teachers. Um, in Michigan, we have the ability to have special uh, specialization certifications, and there isn't one in assessment, and the MAC would like to create that. And again, our, our goal is to provide an assessment specialist administrator to every school and every district. Uh, very, very um, uh, noble goals. Uh, it be interesting to see if, if we're able to, to achieve that. But uh, a little bit of a synthesis. Um, you know, assessment literacy is important for all those affected by education, which is just about all of us, uh, some more than others. Uh, but, but all of us have a stake in the quality of education of our students, uh, either directly or indirectly. And so assessment literacy is, is important for all of us. We think that everyone can become more assessment literate. And as I indicated, uh, uh, learning about assessment can range from introductory kinds of things to in-depth learning about assessment that may take 
a year or more. Um, assessment illiterate educators will be more effective users of assessment, and we believe that this will ser serve to improve student learning and and uh, uh, student student achievement. And then. Assessment literacy policymakers will help to assure that only sound assessment policies are promulgated. I know some might think, well, what in what world is that going to occur? But that that is the goal of of teaching about assessment to to policymakers that that it isn't just educators that all all of those who are affected by education need to learn more about assessment. And a couple of resources that are on the MAC website are some principles that that uh, would, would with related questions that policymakers should ask when when uh, uh, adopting uh, new assessment designs or assessment programs, um, and uh, and then we just recently created a set of eight eight questions or principles that should guide the selection of actual assessment instruments used in assessment programs, and uh, you should be able to find both of those on the Michigan Assessment Consortium org website. So, Elizabeth? Great, Ed, thank you so much for such a comprehensive discussion today of assessment literacy, the purposes, intentions around that work, and um, for kind of synthesizing that there at the end with some ideas for how folks can take this into their practice. Uh, you'll see in the parking lot Mary Kay notes that there are very many uh, education faculty who are, are assessment literate in doing this, and mm -hmm. we applaud those, that work and those efforts and yes. want to encourage more folks to move along in that direction. So um, we hope that folks that were on the webinar today have learned something new that you can take into your work. Um, mm -hmm. Theon also shares some of the work that she's doing in Pennsylvania and um, opens up for feedback from colleagues here in today's webinar. Um, before we wrap up for today, um, we did already ask a very similar question to number two that's on the slide. We're going to do two things simultaneously. Um, one, we'll ask for your key takeaways from today's presentation. So it's helpful for us to know what was the most important thing that you took out of our discussion today. And I'm also going to put up a box where you can ask any remaining questions. So uh, you'll see both of those come up on your screen. And we have just a few minutes left where you can respond. And we will also try to respond to any other questions that you all have. Well, that, well, that's taking place, Elizabeth. I, I'm, I'm going to try and address one of the questions I touched on a little bit earlier, but it might be good to look at it again. Um, how do you address the multiple interests of varied stakeholders in assessment, classroom level for teachers versus system level for leadership, mindful, mindful of the implications, for example, opportunity costs? I want to remind folks that, that state agencies uh, did receive a letter from the uh, U.S. Secretary of Education uh, indicating uh, how the ESSA resources provided to states and to local districts uh, can be used by states and or local districts uh, to review the um, assessments uh, that are being used, their purposes, their uses, their costs, uh, obviously assessment time, um, and benefits. Uh, and so to me, uh, it, it, this would be a, a and in what I've seen are districts, uh, district committees that have engaged in these kind of efforts. Uh, there are a couple of inventory assessment inventories, one by the Achieve Group, uh, and then the Michigan Assessment Consortium has developed one, uh, where for the various stakeholders to collect evidence about the assessments actually being used, and and it's in that context then 
of, of kind of a local decision making process that I think the the multiple interests of various stakeholders can be addressed um, because to me the the best assessment systems are ones that that try and address as many of the stakeholders' interests in in assessment information uh, with the least amount of redundant assessment effort um, and there is no a magic formula for that. It is something that really has to be worked on within within districts, within states. Um, and I think it was very helpful that the U.S. Department of Ed provided resources that and an indication of how the resources could be used for that purpose locally. So uh, again, I th I think that and then to me one of the key things that any such uh, assessment inventory committee. Uh, ought to be asking, and that is, what do we need to to do to help the various parties, administrators, teachers, parents, students, become more assessment literate? How do we how do we uh, get there? So. What Great. I, what, so a lot of nice takeaways here. Um, we always appreciate mm -hmm. when folks walk away and want to share the information. So that is why we make it available. I think we said it somewhere, but I'll repeat that the webinar will be available in about two to three weeks, and you should receive an email indicating that it's ready for viewing, so you can share that link and share the resources that you saw today um, with any colleagues and um, potentially in professional development that you might be engaged in. Looks like a lot of folks are pleased um, to receive the self-assessment and looking forward to using that in their schools. Chris, Christy Bergen uh, asked the question, uh, what would you recommend as one of the best books, articles for, on formative assessment for teachers and principals? I think, I think uh, Jim Popham had a book uh, uh, designed for, uh, on, on formative assessment designed for administrators that uh, ASCD published. I don't have the title right on hand, but I think he would be a a good source for that. Margaret Heritage, I think, is an excellent writer uh, for for teachers, as is Susan, Susan Brookhart. Um, Margaret has a, has a couple of books on the topic of formative assessment for classroom teachers, and and would be a a, a good um, uh, source for uh, an introduction to formative assessment for teachers. Uh, Yvonne says, how can we move legislators to stop ranking schools with a standardized summative testing? I, um, unfortunately, the, the um, U.S. Department of Ed's uh, Secretary of Education's uh, uh, requirement that, that states identify priority and focus schools as the bottom uh, X percent of, of schools in a state is what caused a lot of the, the, the ranking of schools. And uh, I think it's unfortunate because uh, as I, I've been a peer reviewer of state accountability plans and one of the concerns that I have is that if you pick an arbitrary percentage like the 5% five, 5 lowest scoring school, schools in a state are automatically priority schools, how do you know that those are the ones that most need to be helped? How do you know that other schools don't need to be helped? I think it would have been better um, and more helpful to students, in particular, if states had been required to identify the criteria for identifying a focus school and not simply picking the lowest scoring ones. Um, in any kind of uh, rank ordering, you may miss schools that, that should have been identified and include ones that, that, that didn't need to be. So I think that, that uh, unfortunately, it continues to be included within ESSA accountability. So it'll only be if, if states are able to get convinced the federal government that they're able to identify priority and focus schools without ranking that, that it might go away. And even then, it's not assured. I, I think to, to, to finish that thought, though, that, that states do have the ability, uh, although the, the total amount of flexibility to be offered has not been determined yet, that's part of the the, the non-regulatory guidance that the U.S. Department of Ed needs to create in the next several months, but but 
potentially states could could suggest alternatives as long as they they are able to uh, show how they would identify schools in most in need of assistance without ranking. And the question would be whether states try that and, and are approved for doing so. Neither are assured, of course. Well, I can see from the comments and um, the thank yous throughout the parking lot and in our other boxes that folks felt this information was highly useful and informative to them. Um, so Ed, I'll use this opportunity to give you a virtual round of applause from our audience um, <laughs> on the wonderful time we've spent together today in learning more about assessment literacy. And I do see that folks are going to take this out and do the work that's needed to carry on some of these messages. And, that is great. Um, yeah. They'll come back to you with some feedback. So if uh, we could move those poll boxes off the screen, and um, I can get folks your contact information. If you have specific questions about today's topic, you can feel free to reach out to Ed. If you have general mm -hmm. questions about the webinar series or the work that the Realm Mid Atlantic is doing, you can contact me or our general Realm Mid Atlantic email. You can also find us on Twitter and Facebook. Uh, we hope many of you will come back for our upcoming events. You'll see here uh, June we have two events, and um, one is on healthier students or better learners, and another one on English learners and some instructional aspects of focusing on English learners. And as we mentioned at the beginning, it's important to us to collect your feedback on today's webinar. So we'll ask you to take just a few moments to complete the feedback survey. We do value that input and use it to help us improve our series and uh, our different webinar events. So again, Ed, thank you very much for your time today and um, in advance of today's webinar for preparing such a comprehensive overview for our group. Well, I enjoyed it and I'm uh, glad that it's been useful and uh, I hope that we can promote assessment literacy for, for all. Uh, and I know everyone who's attended is going to be a part of that process, so let's go do it. Great. We hope everyone has a great afternoon and evening, and uh, we hope to see you back here in just a few weeks for our next event.